Mike, I don't know if you can find it or not, but I'm going to start because you know me, I can't sing, but in my heart is that old song, Victory in Jesus, number 120 in the red back if you're one of those folks, but uh, help me sing this morning, or you sing and I'll help you, but uh, it starts with, I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sin. And won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Give him praise one more time. I may remember when you heard that old, old story, when you were lost and you were in your sins and you needed a Savior. You know, you couldn't do it on your own anymore. And somebody shared Jesus with you and you accepted him into your heart. For some of you, that might have been your parents, might have been a preacher somewhere. But aren't you thankful today that somebody cared enough to share Jesus with you? Amen and amen. I, uh, uh, the longer I've been around preaching and the more that I, I've been around the Word of God, you know what I've come back to? That, you know, we're always looking for that revelation knowledge, that last revelation. But if we just realize how good He is, if we just realize how much He really loved us, if we realize how much He wanted to deliver us and set us free, if we could just realize some of the simple things of Scripture, it might, it might just set us free from the bondage of this world. Give him praise one more time. Amen. Amen. Um, Micah, you got a picture for me? Do it a little bit here. Who knows what that is? That's the sun, right? Let me give you a little bit of information about that booger. That's the S-U-N. And it says, we tend to take it for granted, but uh, have you noticed that rain came early this year? In February, or no, in December of 2012, we showed up in Oregon to try out to be the pastors of this church. December of 2012. And Tim Nichols and John Parsons showed up at the motel to meet us. And the first thing they said is, we wanted you to come in the wintertime so you'd know how miserable it is in Oregon all winter long. Because it was raining and drizzly and all that. And they said, it's going to rain for eight months. Well, it actually hasn't. Since we've been here, this might be the first year we get eight months of rain, but that's okay because it helps the elk. Amen? Ah, moving on. But does anybody miss this guy? Yes, already? Uh, obviously, you've never lived in Tennessee because you don't even like that guy in Tennessee. But um, let me give you some facts about the sun. It's 93 million miles from Earth. 93 million miles from Earth. It's 864,000 miles across. About 1 million of this planet Earth would fit inside of it. Boggles your mind, doesn't it? And the sun is hot. I joked about this first service. Even Miss Crystal might be warm there, right? The temperature of the core of the sun is 28,799,540 degrees. Almost 29 million degrees. God knew how to build it. He knew how to put it there. If we were any closer, the earth, we would, 
melt. If we were any farther away, we would freeze to death. He gave us the Son to take care of us. Amen? Amen. But then he said that the Son, the S-O-N, is the light of the world. So we've talked about this one. I want to talk for just a little bit this morning about the true light of the world. Turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, we're going to begin with verse 1. John chapter 8, we're going to begin with verse 1. Um, I'm reading out of the King James. I hope that doesn't offend you, but if it does, read your translation. I like this one. Uh, most of the time I read out of like 20 translations, but this is my favorite. Uh, the poetry of it is beautiful, so when you have it, we'll stand for the reading of God's Word. Y'all were too quiet. Too quiet. There you go. Hallelujah. Ha! Ha! <laughs> Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. Now notice what they said here. In the very act. We caught her doing or having adultery. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, red letter edition here, he that was without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, being at the el beginning of the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee, Go and sin no more. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came, and whither I go, but you cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. You judge after the flesh. I judge no man. Jesus just said, I'm not here to judge man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It is. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me also. Miss Wendy, will you bless the reading of the word? Amen. You can be seated. So we begin this story in John chapter 8, one of the four Gospels. And we begin this story with a woman accused of adultery. And Jesus goes there and the men brought it and it said she was caught in the very act of adultery. They want us to know that, right? They add that in there. Now, she was caught in the very act of adultery. I wonder where the dude was, right? Because if you're caught in adultery, there's a good chance there's a partner involved somewhere. So... They bring her to him, and they want to trap him, and they say to Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act, and Moses' law says we have to stone her to death. Now, what are you going to do about it? And I love this part, because Jesus said it was as if he never heard a word they said. 
Let me say this to you. If you're in ministry and if you're a born-again child of God, you're supposed to be in ministry. Sometimes you've got to not hear what the enemy says. Sometimes you're going to get more negative feedback than you ever will positive. But what you do need to do is hear the voice of God. And when you hear the voice of God, you follow what he says and stop hearing what the enemy says. So with that being said, here's Jesus. It says he, sat, he squatted down. He began to write as if he didn't hear a word they said. And they continued. So he stands up and he says to them, to whoever has no sin in your life whatsoever, you cast the first stone. Then he started writing in the dirt again. Then he starts writing in the dirt. You ever wonder what he was writing there? We don't know, but I'm wondering if he's not putting down, Tim Nichols did this on this date. Uh, Jim Nelson did this on this date. Terry Tillengast, the list is too long for me to continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, it says from the oldest to the youngest, they just begin to walk away. And Jesus said these words to the lady caught in the act of adultery. Jesus said, where are your accusers? And then he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He didn't beat her up. He didn't say, you're awful, you're horrible, you're wicked, you're going to split hell wide open. He said, I forgive you. Now don't do this anymore. And the very next words out of Jesus' mouth is, I am the light of the world. He says, I forgive you. Forget it. Move on. Don't do it anymore. And then he turns around and says, I am the light of the world. And there is no darkness in me. And if you follow me, you can follow the light and not the darkness. Now, everybody knows what darkness is? Darkness is not actually a thing. Darkness is the absence of light. Light has no darkness. So when you do this, if we turned all the lights off in here and we did this and, and we turned on our cell phone, we would have a light, right? Remember when you actually had to have a flashlight? You don't have to do that anymore. Now you've got a light you can carry around with you. But it chases the darkness away. Now Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Micah, you got my second picture? I want you to see something here. If you look at this picture, the light has no shadow. The light has no darkness. Only what carries the light has darkness. Only me, I cast a shadow. The light has no shadow. But yet, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, there will be no darkness in you. In Matthew, I believe it's chapter 5, he said to them, This day this was fulfilled, that Christ the Lord came, the light came to the world, that darkness would be defeated and that it would be overtaken by light. And here he is saying, I am the light of the world. The only thing that has darkness gives off shadow, but the light does not give off shadow. So this morning I have a question for the body of Christ. If Jesus didn't condemn the sinner, and he condemned the Pharisees because of their Pharisee spirit, if you will, why is, not, not this group, but as a whole, why is the church looking for the sin in other people's lives. Why are we out to get them? Why are we out to condemn? Why are we out to go, Ooh, homosexual, homosexual, adulterer, adulterer, thief, thief, you're all going to hell. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and in me is no darkness. And if I live in you, the only darkness that should be cast from a born-again child of God is none, none, none. First Thessalonians, here's what he writes to them. He literally writes, I believe it's chapter 3, verse 5. He says, encourage one another. 
Lift each other up. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He did not say, if you condemn the world, I'll draw all men to me. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in me shall be saved. And I did not come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. And then he finishes in verse 19 and says, I am the light of the world. If I am truly the light of Jesus Christ. I'm not holding it up here. I'm not the matchstick. It's supposed to be in here. If all I ever do is cast shadows, if all I ever do is speak death, if all I ever do is tell you how awful you are, where is Christ? But yet today, somehow, some of the church, not all of us, not you guys, the one down the street, but some of us somewhere along the way have decided that God ordained us to get them. <laughs> and Ephesians 5.1 says that I am to imitate Christ. Christ said, neither do I condemn you. In fact, I never came to condemn you. I came to lift you up. I came to drag you out of the mud. I didn't come to step on you while you're down there. So I'm going to be open with you for a moment. When something goes wrong in my life, I start checking me to see what I'm doing that might have caused it. I'm like, God, what, what am I doing wrong for my mom to be this sick? You know, I can't go to Tennessee every time. I can't do this. God, you've got to take care of her. So I check myself. And I start seeing how awful and rotted I am and how horrible I am. And do you know what I found out? That I can get up here and preach to you that I need to be the light because the light lives in me. But when I go home and put you down or you down or you down or you down or you down, when I condemn the homosexual or I condemn this one or that one or I condemn this one for their drug addiction or I condemn that one for this, I am literally casting a shadow that should not be in me. And I want God to fall on this place. And I want the Holy Ghost to fill everybody. And I want everybody to speak in tongues and run the aisles. And cancer to fall off at the front door. And I can't even speak life over my neighbor beside me. All I can do is speak death. And if I can't even give that much light, how can I expect God? Jesus said, Jesus said for me to imitate him. That book, Jesus said for me to imitate him. And he did not condemn his brother for the sins. He did not condemn for the mistake. And our job is not to go out and to condemn. Because what happens when we do, we drive them away from God. God said, if I love him first and my neighbor as myself, that everything else works out. Do you know I have actually heard people, we talked about this Wednesday night. If you're missing Wednesday night, the Bible study is absolutely off the chain, amazing. It is cool. If you like it, it's good. Uh, but I literally found out there was a man came to me one time. I preached on sin for like six straight weeks. And he said, I'm leaving the church. And I said, why? He said, because I can never measure up to God. You have taught me that I'll never be good enough. I'm damned to hell and I'm never going home. And I have to go home as a minister of the gospel of Christ and wonder how many people I've driven away because I've told them they're not worthy. When God said, you are so worthy, I will let my son die on Calvary for your sins. I came that he could set you free, not to condemn you, but to deliver you. And I see the light inside of the Christians today. 
And if we're not careful, it'll be shadowed in darkness. And if we shadow it in darkness, is it the true light of Christ? If we shadow it in darkness. Now, I know we can say all we want about God called me to do this. God called me to do that. But what does his word say? His word says I am to imitate him. I am to love my neighbor as myself. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Nails in your hands and feet. Stripes on your back till your intestines are hanging out. Thorns driven into your brain through your skull and in. You're gasping for air. And you look down and say, God, kill them all. Because that might be what I would do. But he said, Father, they don't understand. They're confused. Can you forgive them for this? Can you forgive them for this? And then he gave up his spirit. And I'm seeing when he said this about being the light of the world. And the Holy Spirit began to show me that there is no shadow of true light. And the only shadow that's cast of Christ. And even in his word as our brother spoke about. The only shadow that is cast. Is what I add to the light. There is no shadow in Christ. And I can stand up here and beat you to death. And you can die right where you're at. But if I can ever convey to you the love of Christ. What he really did for you. How much he really loves you. It'll set you free from every bondage you have. Because you don't want to hurt him. You don't want to do anything. It's my job to tell you what's sin and what's not. Sure it is. Your job is to read about it and to know and to understand. Honestly, your job is to hear the Spirit of God speak to you and let you know what you're doing is wrong and that you need to fix it. That you can't live and you can't break. You can't sin and kill and lie and steal and do all those things and expect God to bless that. And that. But my job, my job is to show you the light of Christ. My job is to show you that he loves you. And in the midst of your worst mess, he still loves you. My son sent me a message today. Dad, I remember when we were at Barber Motorsports. I'm there today watching the finals of the AMA Superbikes. I'm like, dude, go Cameron Bobier. Seven points down. Go, baby, go. And he's not living for God right now. But it doesn't change my love for him one ounce. It doesn't change one ounce of love I have for that boy. I would give my life for any one of those children right now. Just like that. You know why I can say that? Because I believe I know where I'm going. And if I'm secure and they're not, my life means nothing compared to theirs. And Christ gave everything that he had so that you could see this glorious light. He says, I came to set captives free. He says, encourage one another. He doesn't say, beat them down, tear them down. He says, encourage one another. Think about this for just a moment. I know there's 40 people out today. But think about what 50 or 60 people could do in a town of 10,000 if they never heard anything but positive from us. If all they ever saw was the light of Christ. Neither do I condemn you. What about the homeless man? If you drove by him today, there's one in particular has a buggy and two dogs. What if you just stopped and told him what beautiful dogs he has today? When's the last time somebody said anything good to him? Wish I could grow a beard like you got, man. Say something positive. Speak life and not death into people. Jesus, when the woman was in the midst of sin, 
the very next word after he said, I don't condemn you, he said, I'm a light. I'm designed to bring light. And that very light lives inside of me. And if you're a born-again child of God, that light lives inside of you. And a true light casts no shadow. We spoke Wednesday night. I'm about to close, but we spoke about a race car driver. If you were here, you know that. And he hit a wall. 1984, a Formula One race car driver hit a wall. And he was so distraught about hitting the wall that he said, they said, what happened? He said, the wall must have moved. But his integrity was such that they went and measured the wall and found out that someone had hit the wall and moved it over about a quarter of an inch. But his integrity in a race car was so much that when he said the wall must have moved, they surely believed him. If the integrity of the body of Christ gets to the place when we say the sky is falling and the world runs for cover instead of laughing at us. When we become the head and not the tail. This will happen when we begin to shine the light of Christ the way we are intended to shine the light of Christ. As long as all we cast is darkness, the world will be in darkness. We have to cast a light. And we have not just a light. Turned around. Not just a light. We have the light. We have the light. And I don't know about you, but I've been beat down long enough. I've had the world tell me I'm no good. I've had Christians tell me I'll never be good enough. I've had the world tell me I'll never be good enough. But I have a heavenly father that says, I love you. And I believe in you. And I say, God, do you know the mess I am? You know how many mistakes I've made today? Do you know my lack of faith? Do you know the thoughts that go through my head? And he said, while you were still a sinner, I died for you. I died for you while you were in that mess. Now, come on. Pick up your bootstraps. Don't do this anymore. Come on. We got to go. We got to come on. We got work to do. And church, we can learn every revelation from God's word from front to back. But if we don't learn love, we have nothing. We have nothing. I challenge you. First of all, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you don't have that light, if you're not sure, Today's your day to get that light. But if you have the light of Christ, if you are a born again child, I'm not talking about if you're struggling, we all make mistakes, we all struggle, but if you're genuinely seeking a relationship with Christ in your life, I'm going to challenge you today. Speak life to somebody this week. Speak life to somebody today. Because you're a waitress at the restaurant that didn't fill your water glass and you're not about to tip her, She might not have filled it because at 3,000 miles away, her mom's in an intensive care unit and her mind can't think about a glass of water. And you get a call right before church. says, I don't know that she's going to make it. And all I'm worried about is my silly glass of water. Where is the light of Christ? Where is the light of Christ? I send some of you scripture every day and almost every single day I try to encourage you to know that God loves you even though you're going through a storm. Church, if we can't learn to love and be the light, how will the world ever know who the light is? All we'll be is casting the shadow, not the light. I know it sounds like I'm roughing you up, but I'm telling you the truth from the bottom of my heart. God's people are going to have to love him first and love people. 
or we're never going to see the revival to take this world. But we still can see that revival. Because here's what I know. If a light's inside of me, when I take a step, it goes with me. So everywhere I go, I'm spreading light or spreading darkness, Jim. I don't want to stand before God and try to explain to him why I was out to get the sinner. Because you convince me, Lord, I'm out to get him. Because all he's ever done is love me. When he should have struck me dead a long, long time ago. But he saw something. And this morning he sees something in you. And although you may not see it because you're shrouded in darkness, he sees it because he's shining a light in areas that you can't see. And he's seeing things in you that you don't even see in yourself. And he's knowing somewhere in him that there is hope for you yet. And that you can overcome what you're going through. And that you can overcome and that you can be set free. And that you can be a light. If Paul killed Christians for a living and God saw something in him. And do you know what it said happened on the road to Damascus? A light shined on him. A light to the man that killed or at least we know held the coats while the first martyr for Christ was stoned Stephen Paul held the coat scripture tells us and here's what my Bible tells me that later on in life Paul was quoting Stephen you don't have to be defeated you can be victorious but you're never going to do it with shining darkness and not light. And as Brother Jesus said, you've got a whole book of truth before you. Maybe it's time we click off the boob tube and open the word. Or heaven forbid, put down Candy Crush Saga. Ha! <laughs> Father, I come to you right now. God, I don't mean to sound angry, and I know sometimes I do, but I'm hurting for your people, Lord. You said if we lifted you up that you would save the world. Help us to lift you up, and not just it with our brothers and sisters, but to the world. Help us, help us, God, break our hearts of condemnation. Humble us before you that we would truly love our neighbor. That we would be heartbroken for them. That we would weep for them. God, I'm tar tired of watching them die and go to hell. I cannot imagine your heart. But I'm praying that your heart infiltrate this church. And that our priority become you first. And then loving others. And then to heal us, deliver us, and set us free. But teach us, O oh God, to love one another. And to be like you, as Ephesians 5, 1 says, to imitate you and shine the light. Let us be a city on a hill, a light that cannot be covered. Let us show no shadow around us. Father, if there's one here that doesn't know you, let them know you today. Stand with me, if you will. If you have a need this morning...